So um, I'm just picking up where we left off yesterday. Any that we don't get over in class today, I'll just make a video of during the day today and then put that. Um, I don't know if you saw in Polaris, there's a little final exam folder. And so I put yesterday's video and I'll put today's video in there and then I'll put anything extra in as well. Okay, any questions? All right, um, the first one, implicit differentiation. Not too bad, right? We take the derivative. The one term you got to really watch is this middle guy right in here. Okay, that's the one. If you're going to mess up, it's going to throw. That's the term that's going to throw you off. It's a product rule. Okay, so we take the derivative of the first, which is 2x. Then the derivative of the second term is a product rule. So we do the derivative of the first. Now keep the negative with the 4 and the x. Like keep that all one. If you do that, you won't mess up. Okay, but if you only keep the 4x together and not the negative, that's where we run into problems, okay? So the derivative of negative 4x is negative 4 times the second, and then plus the first, which is negative 4x, times the derivative of the second. So when we do implicit differentiation, we have this second letter. We put whatever the derivative is, which is like 1, that's what we have to write, but because it's not an x, we put a dy dx with it. And then the derivative of y squared is 2y, but again, we need dy dx with it. And then the derivative of 4 is 0. A really common mistake is to forget about the 4 and just put a 4 down. And that answer choice is waiting there for you, just in case you do that. Okay, it's multiple choice, remember. All right, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep these two terms here together and factor the dy dx out. And the other two are going to move out of the way to the other side. So I have dy over dx times, I'm going to put the positive term first, 2y minus 4x equals, and then when I move these over, they change signs. So the negative 4y becomes positive 4y. The positive 2x becomes minus 2x. And then from here, we divide both sides by the 2y minus 4x. So we get dy over dx equals. Now, this could be an answer, but I'm not going to leave an answer like that because all of those are divisible by 2, right? So I could factor a 2 out of the top to get 2y minus x. I could factor a 2 out of the bottom to get y minus 2x. And then those 2s could cancel right there, giving me 2y minus x over y minus 2x. Overall, you guys have done very well on that kind. I'm really not concerned. You know, it's just the little things, like with that, you know, product rule and with that form. Those are really the two places that if you're going to mess up, it's going to be there. Okay? Any questions there? Uh-huh. Um, where do you, from the dy over dx to the 2y minus 4x, how does that change the 4y minus 2x? Uh, no, no. These two terms went to the other side. That's what those are. Okay. And then these two are this. So you, yeah, you, I, you, you had that, you and then we divided by that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next. Two cars start moving from the same point. Here's my point. One travels south. So this one's going this way. It's 60 miles per hour. Now, when it travels south, the rate is negative because... It's giving direction. So really, it's negative 60 miles per hour. And I always let that be my y term since the y-axis goes up and down. So this is going to be my dy dx, or dt actually is with respect to time. The other travels west. So this guy's going in this direction. Again, a negative direction. Like think of an xy-axis. Going down is negative. Going that way is negative, you know at 25 miles per hour, and this is like my x-axis, so I'm going to say dx dt equals negative 25 miles per hour. And then it says, at what rate is the distance between the cars? That is this side right here. I'll call that my z. So that's saying at what rate, so that's the question, increasing two hours later. And so you almost feel like you don't have enough um, information, but they actually do give you something with this two hours. 
If they start from the same point right here, and this one goes 25 miles an hour in that direction for two hours, 25 times two, two hours, says he's going to go 50 miles in that direction. And that would be x is negative 50. If you're talking about that point right there, because of it going to the left, it's going to be negative. Then we have to do the same thing here. This side here, if they're going 60 miles per hour for two hours, that means they're going 120 miles south. So this is negative 120. I could find z over for this side since I know those two sides using Pythagorean theorem, right? So we have our x squared plus y squared equals z squared. And so 50 squared is 2,500. y squared is 144 with two zeros equals z squared. So this is 1, 6, 9, 0, 0 equals z squared. And so z, the square root of 169 is 13, and the square root of 100 is 10. So there's my 130. That's how I do that in my head. Okay, you're going to have a calculator. Use your calculator. Okay, fine. I'm just too lazy to get mine out. Next, we have to take the derivative of this so that we have a place to plug all of the dy, dx, or dy dp, dx dt, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's 2x dx dt plus 2y dy dt equals 2z dz dt. Of course, we talked about this before. The twos don't have to be there. Or you can leave them there. Okay. Just want to show that the AP assignment is not active anymore. Right, it was due this morning. I thought it was due for class. No. Uh-uh. Okay. Okay. All right. And then x here is negative 50. dx dt is negative 25. y is 120. dy dt, negative 60. Ah, oh, that's supposed to be negative. I left my negative out right there. Equals z, which is 130 and dz dt. We don't know. From here, I'm going to steal answers from my paper. I could probably do it just as easily this way. 5 to the 4, 2, 5, 0. Minus, minus, no, plus, because of the two negatives, 72 with two zeros equals 130 dz dt equals what? 8, 4, 5, 0. Oh. numbers up at this point. You guys really trust me at this point? <laughs> I really am going to look at my paper and steal that answer, though. Let's see if I'm right at all. Who knows? Eight, four, five, oh, one. Hey, yeah! 65 miles per hour. So the distance between them is increasing at 65 miles per hour since it's positive. Okay. So remember that kind? We're coming back. We've done so much this year, you know, to narrow it down to just 40 problems. When you pull that equation in the DTS, like, mm -hmm. is that just like? It's taking the derivative of this. Derivative of x squared is 2x. Oh. But since it's with respect to t, dx dt. Derivative of y squared is 2y, 2y dt. Got it? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I just pulled it out of thin air. It's magic. Voila. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's just the derivative of that. Any other questions? Next one. The top of a 15-foot ladder slides down a vertical wall. So here's my wall, here's my floor. Okay. Here's my ladder. I'm trying to reach something up there. Lean it against the wall. The ladder is 15 feet, so this side right here is 15 feet, okay? Does the ladder change at all? The ladder change lengths? So as it slides, it's still the same length, right? So that means dz dt is equal to zero, and that sometimes is what people are like, well, I don't have all the information. Just remember that. If you feel like that's the case, maybe one of them is zero. 
does something always stay the same way? You just kind of ask yourself that. It's sliding down a vertical wall at a rate of one foot per second. So that means this part right here is sliding down this way. So that direction is negative, right? At one foot per second. So negative one foot per second, I'm gonna call this my dy dt, since it's, again, like my y-axis. At the moment when the bottom of the ladder is three feet from the wall. So this distance is three feet. It slides away from the wall at what rate? So the question is, what is dx dt? It's sliding away from the wall. If that end's going down, this end's coming this way. Okay, so kind of draw a picture, you know, for yourself. It looks like I'm missing a y over here, but since I have two sides, I can use the Pythagorean theorem again. So I could use x squared plus y squared equals z squared to find it. Um, that would be 9 plus y squared equals 225. Subtract 9 from both sides. I get the square root. Or, no, not yet. I'm a step ahead. I get 216. And then take the square root of both sides. It's plus or minus, but that is above the x-axis, so it's positive. So y is the square root of 216. I would not take and get the decimal for that because then you've got this many numbers to write. Square root of 216 is easy to write compared to that. Okay. All right, next I'm going to do some magic again and I'm going to take the derivative of that. Okay. Is it okay if I put x dx dt plus y dy dt equals z dv dt and get the twos out of there since I just did it on the last board? Are we okay with that? X is 3. DX, DT, we don't know. Y is the square root of 216. DY, DT is negative 1. Z is 15. DZ, DT, 0. I love it when there's a 0 because that term completely goes away. So this gives me 3 DX, DT plus, no, minus, since that's a negative, minus the square root of 216 equals zero. Move the square root of 216 to the other side and divide by three. Now go to your calculator and put it in and get an answer. And when you do, you end up getting 4.899. And that would be feet per second. Yeah. Um, where is the negative one? <laughs> Up here they said that the ladder slides down the wall at one foot per second. So since it's going down, it's negative. So this is the dy dt. Another question? Uh -huh. uh, could you go to the back to the last problem real quick? Yep. Uh, the last part? Yeah. All right, next one. Use logarithmic differentiation to find the derivative of a function. We didn't do this a lot. We didn't have to do it a lot, okay? Look at the word, logarithmic differentiation. That means a logarithm is going to happen into the problem. Use the directions to help you remember that. You can take an LOG or an LN of both sides. LN is easier, okay? The problem is I have an X in the base and an X in the exponent. That's when you use logarithmic differentiation. You can't use your power rule. You can't use your... Uh, exponent rule, you know, so you've got to get the x out of the exponent, which means you need a logarithm. So you take the log of both sides. So natural log of y equals the natural log of x to the cosine of x. Now, hopefully you remember the rule. that if there's an exponent with a log, it can fly out front. If it's out front, it can fly to the exponent, right? So this is going to fly to the front. So we have the natural log of y equals cosine of x times ln of x. It's asking us to find the derivative. 
I have not found a derivative yet. I have only maneuvered this thing around so that it's ready for me to take a derivative. Now I can take a derivative, okay? So the derivative of natural log of y is one over y, but because it's a y, we need a dy dt. <coughs> oh, sorry, dy dx. <coughs> Bless you. <coughs> Again. Over here I have a product rule. Derivative of the first is negative sine of x times the second plus the first stays the same this time. I need the derivative of the second. The derivative of a natural log of x is just 1 over x. From here, I try to get dy dx by itself. So I multiply both sides by y. So I get dy dx equals y times negative sine x natural log of x plus cosine of x over x. Can I just do that? And your final step then is to substitute what y is. Remember at the very beginning, y was defined to be x to the cosine x. That's your final step. So dy dx equals x to the cosine x times negative sine x ln x plus cosine x over x. It's not difficult. It's just it's strange. You know, it's a little different, and you haven't seen it as much. Okay. So one over x. What about x is one the cosine x over x? Cosine times one is cosine oh. of one times x. You can leave it as that, but it's it's again, it's multiple choice. You just have to be able to pick it up. Okay. Yeah. Um, is that how the answer will show up? Yeah. Won't be some oh, that'll be it. Will they always be like that? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, logarithmic, logarithmic differentiation is very straightforward. Yeah, there's no tricks. There'll be an x in the base and an x in the exponent. <coughs> the only time you need it. Okay. Find the critical numbers of the function. Yeah. Um, will it be worded like this? Not necessarily. It might not have the wording that says that. It might just say find the derivative. So know that logarithmic differentiation is when there's an x in the base and an exponent. So, yeah, I can't promise you that part. <clears throat> critical numbers. Do you know what critical numbers are? Where the first derivative equals 0. Okay. Is this the first? Yep, it's the first derivative. And if you go back, you know, one thing you guys could do that would be very helpful to you is go back to your first day of notes and just read through your notes and have a little piece of paper sitting there to the side so that anytime you run into something as you're reading it, you know, like a, a derivative rule or, you know, something like a definition, like critical numbers, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, put that over there, you know, with critical numbers and extreme values we kind of studied at the same, within the same couple days of each other. The only difference is extreme values are maxes and mins. Critical numbers are also inflection points that have a slope of zero. So it's all where derivative equals zero. Okay. So for this right here, we first find the derivative. 3x squared plus 12x minus 15, and then set it equal to zero. Now, a lot of you try to just start factoring with parentheses right here. Guys, if you would factor out a greatest number, you know, with the greatest common factor, it makes the factoring so much easier. Okay, aren't they all divisible by three? We factor the three out. Now, doesn't that look a lot easier to factor? You know, it takes you a lot less time if you, you know, kind of just shape it down a little bit, you know? So let's see. X squared breaks up into X times X. Factors of negative 5 to give us 4 are positive 5 and negative 1. And so x equals negative 5 and positive 1. These are your critical numbers. Okay, so you guys right now are saying, can we have 10 of those, right? <laughs> 10 of the 40. Make 10 of the 40 that question. It's easy, okay? You have easy problems, you have hard problems, you know? So don't get stuck on one. Get through. Do them all. Do all the easy ones, then come back and get the hard ones. You know. Okay, next one. Oh, critical numbers again. 
Well, same thing, right? But this time there's a product rule involved and there's an e to a power involved, you know. So again, we take the derivative and we set it equal to zero. But this here is a product rule. So the derivative of the first times the second plus, product rule gets a plus sign, right? The first stays the same this time, derivative of the second. So we have e to the negative 3x, and then chain rule, derivative of negative 3x times negative 3. One of the answers that will be there will be without that negative 3, just in case you forgot. Okay? I want you to feel good about your answers. I want your answer to be there for you, even if it's wrong. Right? <laughs> That's so bad, isn't it? 2xe to the negative 3x minus 3x squared e to the negative 3x. Now, is this the only way the answer could be given? I mean, like this, let's talk about it. They both have an e to the negative 3x, right? What if we factor that out? What if we factor an x and an e to the negative 3x out? Then that term would have a 2. This term would have a 3x. I mean, the answer could be given like that. Okay, both answers are correct. I'm just, you know, being devil's advocate here and saying, what if I didn't leave it that way? What if I factored it instead? Will you be able to find your answer? Okay. Question. So you're not finding the critical number? Oh, sorry, equals zero. Yeah, it, thanks for keeping me in line. I was thinking I was just taking the derivative. <laughs> All right, so then I would want to do this, right? As I set the first equal to zero, x equals zero is one of them. e to the negative 3x never equals zero. e to any power never equals zero. It's never negative, it's always positive. You might remember that from back then. We haven't talked about it for a while. And then where does this equal zero? That equals zero, you could say, where is two minus three x equals zero? And you could solve it. Or you could use a shortcut for it, x equals 2 thirds, either way. So x equals 0 and x equals 2 thirds are my two critical points. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Keep me in line, guys. So this ignores the x <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't ever equal 0. So that does not yield a critical value. <coughs> All right, next one, find all points of inflection. There's our second derivative right there, okay? So we take the first derivative, which is 3x squared plus 6x. We don't even need to do a number line test. They're not asking me anything about anything for a first derivative, right? Second derivative, 6x plus 6, set it equal to 0. Move the 6 to the other side, we get 6x equals negative 6. Divide by 6, x is negative 1. Now, you do have to check it to make sure it's an inflection point. Maybe this doesn't have an inflection point. So if you know about the graph of a cubic function, you know it has inflection points, right? So it probably is. But just to verify it, let's test a value to the left and a value to the left and a value to the right. Plugging the negative 2 into the second derivative, I get negative 12 plus 6, which is negative. Plugging the zero in, I get positive. It changes signs, so it is an inflection point. So find all points of inflection. That is only the x value. A point of inflection is a point, a coordinate point. Okay, so I have to take this negative one and plug it back in up here, which is going to give me negative one plus three, which is two. So this here is my inflection point. Yes. So we don't have a problem. Be, yeah, yeah. Yep. <clears throat> AP, on the other hand, they do. You guys do not. Not since it's multiple choice. If it would have been, you know, open ended, then you would have, you know, had it like that. So. Can only do what we can do. So this one here would be like three different questions, you know, on on the test itself. So f of x equals thirty six x plus three x squared minus two x cubed. Find the intervals of increase and decrease. So that's first derivative. Positive is increase. Negative is decrease. Local maximum and minimum values. That's where the first derivative changes signs. And then last, the intervals of concavity and inflection points. So that's our second derivative. Okay. This, you're right, would be asked in different, you know, different questions. 
All right, so we first need, let's see, the first derivative. Let's stop by there. We get 36 plus 6x minus 6x squared. I personally, I know I have to factor it. I'd probably switch it around. Oops, do that. And I would factor a negative 6 out x squared minus x minus 6, so that then when I factor it, it's a little bit easier. x minus 3x plus 2. Is that it equal to 0? This is at x equals 3 and negative 2. So I do my number line test. This is first derivative. Negative 2 is over here, 3 is over here. I'm going to pick values to test, maybe negative 3, 0, and 4. And I plug it into this factored form. The negative 6 means that there's a negative. Plugging the negative 3 into here gives me a negative. Plugging the negative 3 into here gives me a negative. So this section overall is negative. It's decreasing. Next, I plug the 0 in. I get a negative, a negative, and a positive, which is positive for that section right there. Then I plug the 4 in, and I get a negative, a positive, and a positive, which is mm, negative for that section right there. Yeah? This one right here. First derivative. The factored form is the fastest. You could plug it into this here, but then those are like big numbers to plug in, but you can. You're allowed to. There's one, two, three pieces to this, the negative six. Yep. Yeah, if you factor something out, many times it's a positive that you're factoring out. This one happened to have negative, though. And so it's changing all of those to the opposite of what you expect. All right, so this thing, let's see, is increasing on the interval from negative two to three, and it's decreasing on the interval from negative infinity to negative two and from three to infinity. Next question, find the local maximum and minimum values. This does not say find the x value of them. It says find the minimum and maximum value. That means you start with the x value and you have to plug it into the function to find how high is it going or how low is it going. So it looks like there is a minimum of something when x equals negative 2 because it goes minus plus. And there is a maximum of something when x equals 3. We don't list these as points. Okay, unless it says what's the maximum point. It doesn't have that word. So, to find the minimum, we're going to take the negative 2, we're going to plug it into the original function. f of negative 2, and again, you can use your calculator, negative 72 uh, plus 12, and then plus 16. So that's negative 60 plus 16, which is negative 44. Does that sound right? Do we have that? Yeah, you verify. Okay. Plug the 3 in. F of 3 equals 108 plus 27 and then minus 54. So it's like 108 minus 27, which is 81. Again, use your calculator. Okay. Yeah. What was the scenario where you might not have your maximum? Maybe just, or just, I don't know, if there's self, if there was a <laughs> um, This wouldn't have a max or min. That's my phone. Sorry. Um, like this wouldn't, or yeah, if you had like 1 over x, where it's like this on one part <coughs> and this on another part, you know. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? So what is yeah, use your calculator to graph it, too. You can use that, too. I mean, that's the thing. When you were doing this in this class, you weren't allowed to use your calculator. You know, you should have to use some calculus to get this stuff. It's actually shorter. All right, next, find the intervals of concavity. All right, so that means I need a second derivative. So here was my first derivative. One of those lines right there. I'm probably going to use this guy right here. So f double prime of x is equal to negative 12x plus 6 plus zero, set it equal to zero, 
Let's see, 6 equals 12x, x equals 1 half. Again, we go to the number line. Here's 1 half. Test a value on the left, which is maybe 0. Test a value on the right, which is maybe 1. Plug it into this. Plugging the 0 in, I get positive. Plugging the 1 in, I get negative. There's an inflection point there. Okay. So this is asking for concavity. So let's see, we're going to say concave up uh, from negative infinity to 1 half and concave down from 1 half to infinity. Inflection points, I know the x values. I have to plug it in to find the y value. So I need f of 1 half. I don't remember the original function. 36 times 1 half is 18. I'll just look at that. That's okay. And then it's 3 times 1 half squared would be 3 times 1 fourth, which is 3 fourths. And then this is minus 2 times 1 half cubed, which is 1 eighth. So that would be minus 1 fourth. So this is 18 minus 1, which is 17. I got 16 before I got out of nowhere. I did. I just had the wrong number. So, uh, 1 half, 17. Okay. Questions on that one? Okay, number 23. Verify that the function satisfies the hypothesis of the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem has some different pieces to it. Yeah. Uh oh. Um, I was just looking for the last problem. Uh huh. How does the water are supposed to be the case here? Because you're adding the um, just three fourths. Do I have a sign error somewhere? The three fourths is not the big one. Oh. When I plugged a one half and yeah, okay, there we go. Thank you. So 18 plus a half, 18 and a half. There we go. Thank you. Yep, sign error right there. Okay. Mean value theorem. Remember, there was like four steps. It has to be continuous. It has to be differentiable. It's multiple choice, so I'm not going to be checking that kind of stuff. But is this cubic function continuous? Is it differentiable? You know, it's a cubic function. There's no corners, cusps, vertical tangents. You know, we're good with that. Um, then find all numbers C that satisfy the conclusion of the mean value theorem. So the other two parts of the mean value theorem is that if you take the derivative of this, 3x squared minus 3, and you plug a C in for it, that's where this C is coming for or from. And then you take the two x values and you come up with those points. Plugging the negative 2 in, I get negative 8 plus 6 plus 2, which would be 0. Plugging the 2 in, I get 8 minus 6 plus 2, which is 4, right? I find the slope. And I set the two equal to each other. And it's whatever c value comes from that. So to find the slope, just make sure your y's are on top and your x's are on the bottom. Um, I just had to grade something for AP last night and a couple of the kids flipped them around. It's just you're so focused on stuff. Sometimes it's the easy stuff that you, you know, let your guard up on. So 4 divided by 4, which is 1. So I'm going to take this and set it equal to 1 and then find C. So I have 3C squared minus 3 equals 1. Add 3 to both sides. Divide by 3, take the square root. 
And what do you have to remember when you take the square root? Plus or minus. So plus or minus, the square root of 4 is 2, the square root of 3, eh, don't know. We just leave it like that. That means there's two numbers here, 2 over rad 3 and negative 2 over rad 3. The last thing you have to do is make sure that they are on the, or they're both in the interval that's given. If one of them isn't, you cross one of them off. But they both are. They're both like 1 point something, negative 1 point something. They're both in there. But I have before given questions where one of them isn't in there, so you have to cross it off. Okay. I, I don't know what I did here. Depends on what version of the text you get. Okay. Are we okay? Yes. Oh, yeah, we're probably about out of time. Yeah. But that's okay. I'm going to, you know, I'll make sixth period, I'll make the video. Of the rest, and I'll get it posted, and I'll do it with the, the document camera so you can see my hands doing it. Okay, I think that's a better video for you guys. Do you agree? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Next, find a limit. Use L'Hopital's rule where appropriate. If there is a more elementary method, consider using it. If L'Hopital's rule doesn't apply, explain why. The more elementary method they're talking about is if it factors into things like sometimes that's easier. So when I plug the zero in here, I get e to the zero, which is one minus one minus zero, over zero squared, which is zero over zero. I mean, tall, right? Apply tall. So we take the derivative of the top, we take the derivative of the bottom, and we do it again. e to the zero is one minus one, two times zero is zero. Uh, well, well, what do we do then? But again, tall again. Derivative of the top, derivative of the bottom. We should be okay this time. Got to get those x's out of the denominator is what's happening here. So we have e to the 0, anything to the 0 power is 1 over 2, boop, boop, 1 half. Okay. What time does this go in? 24. Yeah. We got time for another one. Any questions on that one? A rectangular storage container with an open top is to have a volume of 10 meters cubed. Open storage container with an open top or rectangular. So rectangular storage container is something like this. There's no top. It's open on the top. Okay. It has four sides and a base. The length of its base is twice its width. So if the width is x, the base over here is 2 times x, the width and the base. One is double the other. Material for the base costs $10 per square meter. I'll get to that in a minute. Material for the sides is $6 per square meter, which makes sense. The base needs to be stronger. It's like a soda can, a pop can. It has to be stronger on the bottom than the sides because you're sitting stuff on it, you're stacking things on it. It has to be stronger, okay? So it's going to cost more for the base. Find the cost of the materials for the cheapest container. Okay. Well, what I know here is the volume of this container is the length times the width times the height. We know the volume has to be 10. We know the length is 2x. We know the width is x. We do not know the height. So solve for the height. Okay. 10 divided by 2x squared is equal to the height, or 5 over x squared. Please reduce. If you reduce, your world is so much easier. Okay. Now, they're also talking about the sides and the base of this. That's talking about surface area. The surface area, the base, is 2x times x. There's only one of those. Then you have this side over here and that side over there that are the same. They are x by h. You have two of those. And then you have this front side that's 2x by h and the back side that's 2x by h. So you have two of them that are 2x by h. These being the sides and this being the base. Okay. The problem is I can't have the h's here. So let me kind of clean this up. This is 2x squared plus 2xh plus 4xh is 6xh. I got to get rid of the H. 
That's what this is for. That's why they gave me the volume. I'm going to substitute that in. 6x times 5 over x squared is 30 over x. 2x squared plus 30 over x. This is the surface area. To change this to a cost, the base costs $10. The sides cost six dollars. Then take the derivative. Okay, I mean multiply those out. 